My name is Rachel Carter and I'm the sculptor behind the project Standing in This Place. Yeah, I'm Lisa Robinson and from the Legacy Makers Project. During lockdown, I saw um, a call out from historians and they were looking for people to be volunteer researchers. And my colleague and friend, uh, Dr Helen Bates, was leading on that research. They were looking at the textile industry and particularly how the textile mills across the Midlands were connected to the enslaved that were stolen from Africa and taken to places like South America, America and the Caribbean. Because of our deep interest in our ancestors, um, African um, enslaved people working in the cotton fields and Rachel herself has ancestry. Um, connected to the mills, so mill, mill workers in her family. I think that's what connected us. It was very important to myself as a female artist to represent these women in as true a form as I could. And it was a conversation that I had with Alma at City Arts and she suggested having a talk to Dance4, um, a dance organisation based in Nottingham City. They introduced me to a lady called Dean McQueen and she just got it straight away. She understood what it was that I needed. We put a call out for women over the age of 50. We got some amazing ladies signing up and they looked at the physicality of, the, of these women, getting them to become living sculptures with careful, considered, slow movement. Right, today, Thank you. my focus is primarily working on a number of stillness exercises. There are two ways of arriving at the stillness. We can move into it, or we can position ourselves. Somebody can position us. Can you see the difference? Is everybody okay about that? Do you yeah. fix yourself? In that place. Don't look down, don't look back, don't look sideways, look out. It's the black and white mix. I really like that. And they're really, really friendly people. They're a lovely set of people. And the initial day, um, when we first got together, um, the, there was nothing structurally planned but people just was free to talk and share. And it was absolutely wonderful. We were able to voice how it is. There was a lot of listening and ch changing going on. And right now there's still that unified sort of thing still happening. The group, the people, the friendship, the sharing, it's been really good. The skill of this is being definite, being absolutely definite and making sure that your shoulders don't go, oh, because you get a bit tense and you go, oh. So keep that space here and convince me that you're looking at something. Right, here we go. And just hold it. And come back to the middle. What I want you to do now is using just one arm, think about that arm in space. I think it's harder to move slow than it is to do the big flashy dances. So I think the slow movement, it's kind of got them into the thinking about the sculpture, being a sculptor, well, being a sculpture. <laughs> it's hard to get into that mindset. I think they're doing a fantastic job. Beautiful. What I want you to do is just pair up. I just want you to play together so that you're making a relationship between the two of you. Is there some lead to it or is it just random? Oh, together. I, I, I think together, but in, in a sense, rather than going into a great big spaghetti, because <laughs> if you remember, we're not doing a spaghetti, we're doing a stillness. It has to arrive and be still. Work together and see what happens.
There's a wonderful quality to the way people are moving. Have you noticed that? I think it was like wanting to embrace, but not touch it. Because if you think about, they're in the field, they're wanting to embrace and share, but not touch, because if Massa see them touching, flogging. So it would be the silent language, the proximity. It's that moment of we're together. Yeah. We're together. We made eye contact. I just felt eye contact yeah. was really important. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's interesting. That's why I got a bit stuck on the statues. I did because I actually wanted to move my body more. But I thought we really was being told to extend animals with the mirror. I, I yeah. always always be disobedient to you. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, you know what I mentioned that there were two ways of doing this. You can arrive from travelling or you can get put there. What I want you to do is to and you to pair up, you pair up and you pair up. And I want one couple to sculpt the other. And when you're thoroughly satisfied, change over. <laughs> I felt quite overwhelmed when they started about how am I going to narrow this down. How do you narrow it, uh, this group of fabulous ladies down to two? I think we've just seen them do it themselves. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> and that position. I don't think that's something I would have thought of doing, but they naturally went into that position and it just felt so inviting, connected open I think that's something really strong that can build on to there's a few things I think we need to iron out but we've got a strong basis there already now what is it about yeah what is it that, that the sculptors have done well I personally just look at the, 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 the body and I look at the way this this stood and we stood back didn't we and looked and then adjusted their heads faces so that they looked at each other <laughs> Usually, uh, it takes me quite a while to sort of be myself. But for some whatever reason, with Judy, it was just natural. I feel very strongly about that pair, and it just clicked. They were really comfortable with each other, weren't they? Mm -hmm. The funny thing about that, from my grandma's time, you never look anyone straight in the face. Oh! I was taught that it's rude to do that. Really? Yeah. So over time, I know that. Our eye contact is good, but I still have that with me. It was that last pairing of, of Judy and Louise. There was just, mm -hmm. there was a spark there. There was that openness, that connectivity, and that made you want to go and join in with them, mm -hmm. talk and mm -hmm. touch. Um, so, are you two happy to be the models? Oh, <gasps> wow! <laughs> It was a great shock when they told us because I assumed we were going round the room and just picking out everybody and there's some fantastic dancers and performers oh, yes. everywhere and they'd already been, I, I think I thought who would already be chosen, you know. Just in case anything should happen, we still do need a backup. So I think we need two volunteers that are all of similar size and stature uh, to Louise and Judy. From selecting the, the two models, we started talking about all the intricacies of their pose. Whose hand should go on top of whom? Should the white hand be on top of the black hand or the black hand on top of the white? Should they have eye contact? Should they touch each other? So every single detail was scrutinised. Normally, I'm a little bit distance with people. Yeah, and just for whatever reason it did, I just felt confident. Like I said before, I was able to look you in the eye and I don't do that. <laughs> we were just able to look someone in the eyes for long enough, didn't we? I recognise yeah. from somewhere. I think um, one of the things that really struck me was I had a conversation with one of the legacy makers, uh, well, several of the legacy makers who, who are here, um, Hyacinth, Bettina and Louise, and what they were saying was that the first two meetings that all the women had together was just about talking and talking about the hist these histories and what these histories mean to them and the impact on them um, as women, you know, alive today. And I think that has enabled the group to really um, 
bond. One of the other uh, parts of the project was the costume itself. We set up uh, a, a project called the Minifigures Commission and I worked with an amazing group called Sugar Stealers that are based here in the city of Nottingham. And I asked these ladies to join me on a journey of discovery. That we were going to delve into history, we were going to try and find out as much as we could about the clothing these women would have worn. Welcome to the Museum of Making. We are a museum that looks at things that are, have been made or are still being made in, in Derby and Derbyshire. Uh, shall we go further yes. to the museum? Yes. Yeah. You ladies. This is our gateway gallery. This is where we explore the story of the silk mill, but also the other factories up Devon Valley, uh, which produced more cotton. This mill was a silk mill, um, but the ones up the valley were, were mainly cotton. The silk for this mill was coming from all over. We've got a wonderful document, which is just over there, from uh, 1746 to 1749. It is a copy of all the letters that were sent from this mill, mainly to the owners. So the owners were based up in Leeds, telling them what silk had come in, what quality it was, and a little bit about where it was going to. And it's a really wonderful resource. One of the exhibits that just really caught my eye is this cotton reel. So it's a large wooden reel of cotton thread and it shows an image of the Dolly Abbey Mills. And I found my ancestors actually working in this mill, four siblings aged between 12 and 16. And think of this giant mill complex and the, the small children walking through this mill complex and going to work in these cotton mills. It's just mind boggling trying to think of what they would have encountered during their working day when they should really have been in school. Yeah. We do have indentured servitude, so a lot of, of children from inner city London were kind of scooped up pretty much from, from uh, workhouses and families were kind of given the impression that we're going to go to the countryside and being given a better life. But we've got some really, really awful reports of, of child labour um, of the valley and also in this mill. For this, this area in particular, to explore what textiles is. So I, I will, I'm going to stop talking because the idea of this is people go and explore it. Please do explore. Oh, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Cheers. We've just had a fantastic afternoon with the curator Eilish. So we've been looking through the exhibits, we've been opening drawers, we've been touching things, asking questions, and really delving into the lives of the mill workers. One of the interesting things that came up in a conversation with Dr. Helen was about some of the other artistic forms that came off the, uh, the textile industry, and that was clog dancing. It wasn't something I was aware of before, but she said, you need to go and see the Greenwood clog dancers. They all wear wooden clogs, which is what uh, many of the mill workers would have worn during the Industrial Revolution. But their percussive sound is, it's inspired by that movement of that shuttle that would have been making such a lot of noise within the factory, that rhythmic beating of the machine is then reflected in the, the noise and the rhythmic movement of their clogs. So I had this idea and put it to the clog dancers if they would consider performing in a recording studio. I've recorded albums singing but, but never and playing but never dancing. <laughs> I'm Fiona Banks and my mum is Dorothy Banks and she was born in 1940, so she's now 82. And at the age of 15, she left school, as you did in those days, and she worked at the cotton mill in Accrington, where she was from, and was a cotton mill worker. She wore clogs to work, but, yeah, she often tells me about, you know, working in the mills and, and mouthing, because it was very loud, so they learnt to lip read, um, which is... We used to like Les Dawson, because he, he made a joke of that. <laughs> oh yes, Lucy. Strong arms, mind the step. Well, 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 <laughs> 13. God. Wow. We don't know we were born, but we all oh, went to yeah. And she yeah. always shouted because yeah. they had to shout over yeah. the machines. Yeah. Yeah. 
when well, we're in our things. kit we've got skirts these green skirts hand dyed and then we've got petticoats where we put lace on the bottom mm. because we are from Nottingham which built its reputation on lace these are handmade by a guy called Rick Rubiki and he <laughs> made these vlogs. It's soft Italian leather, so he carved in the Tudor rose. I wanted like the Tudor rose, but it's not painted in any way. But these are really on their way out, I think. They're falling apart, look. Where? Yeah. Everywhere. No, they're not. <laughs> So it was quite technically challenging to record clog dancers, but it worked and we was able then to use that soundtrack and one of the dance sessions that we had, they were looking at the mill workers, their long hours in the mills, uh, their physicality of, of moving with the shuttles, the bobbins, the cotton, but we had that soundtrack of the clog dancers as well that they could respond to and it really did bring to life that, that factory system. I think when you're looking at working class history, it's very difficult to find any information. Finding items of clothing is very difficult, very little survives. So we were very reliant on the help of historians, of museum collections. We also had uh, lectures from Dr. Susan Seymour, and we had a, a day where we delved into books. I had a, a really good chat with an historian today, um, Dr. Helen Bates, and um, she gave me a lot more information about like, the time period. So I brought lots of things to help you with that. Help yourself to your books, have a look through. If you've got any um, things that you want to sort of talk about, about, you know, things that you may have discovered already. I've got sticky notes. So if you find anything interesting in the book, stick a sticky note in there and then you can share it with, with the rest of the group. I just happened upon a, a section in the bit called, there's a chapter on identity and there's threads of life. And although it's from a completely different era, it's from the first, uh, second world war, um, the, the, there's a, a movement that, that embroidered skirts and it said the skirts were metaphors for women's ability to unify from diverse and damaged parts, a swirl of promise and progress. And then there's a hymn and it, the first um, stanza of the hymn is shape by your skirt together connectedness. Unite multiple forms, colours and lines in the stream of historic events. Embroider the design with your heart and your hand. I just thought it sounds nice in terms yeah. of what we're doing. Well, there is a, a link actually that I've been given from an historian about a blue cloth uh, that was made specifically uh, to send to the colonists to, to dress enslaved uh, women and men. And it's called Peniston Blue. Uh, and apparently there's a sample of this cloth in the Dobbs record office. Yeah, I just basically found this word wesh, which they basically, um, the cotton mill workers would basically use to um, psychologically and physically keep themselves clean because that's what was respectable, being clean and like well represented. Um, and obviously they didn't get that. Um, well, wasn't allowed to basically, they had to use the same clothes for both working and when they go home and sleeping. The, the mill workers had a lot more frills. Yeah, yeah, I found that as and well. I was looking at that. And the frills and everything. All the detailing. Yes. With pushed up sleeves. Yeah. So I found that where the, um, the lace bar tree um, originates from it originates in Jamaica and the parts of Jamaica where it originates from is in Clarendon and St Elizabeth now my mum's family is from Clarendon and my dad's family is from St Elizabeth and then the plant was brought over to Europe but it wasn't until 1777 that a European made it um, known to people and his surname was Wright, William Wright, which is um, my family's surname, which is Wright. Do you know like when people say like, oh where's your family from? 
Clarendon or St Elizabeth never really comes up. So it was just bizarre that both places are both in this spot um, and that's where the tree was from. So I'm just even wondering whether were family members involved in the um, making and the cultivating of this tree? Maybe were they healed by it because it was also a healing tree. Um, it was called the tree of life but then also its branches were used for whips so they may have been abused by the tree so the tree has wide branches <laughs> you know it could um, affect people in many ways so yeah it's really interesting we're very much about honoring our ancestors we don't want them forgotten um, they're important human beings who often people just want us to forget these histories they say Enslavement was a long time ago. It wasn't that long ago. And we still feel the legacies today. Um, and we want to honour our ancestors and ensure that people don't forget the incredible contributions that they've made to the wealth of this country. Each of the stitching group received two mannequins. And I asked them if they would create a design for each of their mini figures and then stitch those pieces together. We had a huge bank of fabric that they could select from and I tried to encourage them to not only choose those fabrics by what they look like but also with their texture because ultimately it was the texture that was going to be a key part of the sculpture. Like that side is probably too yeah too colourful. Well, the computer's not going to see any of the yeah. pattern and colour, no, it's, it's going to see, see the, the texture. So the podcast I sent, sent you to listen to was about um, a Welsh plains cloth that was made specifically for dressing the enslaved in. Yeah. Um, and that was a, a woman mm -hmm. cloth. So I was wondering whether some of those might be suitable. Mm -hmm. So anything that you think might be suited for the larger ones then we can put to one side yeah I mean, lovely it's, texture and it's a big yeah. piece as well yeah that's quite a sizable piece isn't it yeah. do you think this would be i mean it, both sides got a good texture for the mm -hmm. photogrammetry if we were using that for photogrammetry we would need to dye it okay so yeah. you could dye the dye it before or after you make it into your garment what, the, the, the anything white, white the white. computer cannot see at okay. all oh. so any of the ones that are sheer yeah we, we could and, and plain mm -hmm. white like mm -hmm. these we could dye them so we've got the big big pieces are those the ones on the toolbox wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And then the rest of it is yours to do with what, you know, as you see fit really. They went away with their research, they did further research on their own independently and when they brought their minifigures back to present I was just blown away by the intricate details, the sheer level of thought that they put into each of those figures and the amount of research that they'd done to, uh, to highlight different aspects of history that these two women were going to represent. Basically, I wanted to, you know, read her stories, it just really is heartbreaking. And I was interested to see the, the podcast about the wool factory and how they made, you know, sort of branded the material. And I was quite surprised that they used wool. Um, and then put a little bonnet on her so that she couldn't keep her hair back from just any machinery and just made her so they were a little bit um, smaller. She is wearing um, a bag skirt because over there they may have got hot and they would have used it to pull up the skirts and also possibly to hold some of the cotton in. So I did more concentrate on uh, winter time as I found like more research to that. So they all had like a fitted cloak so that's why I like, like this little fitted jacket. So we did talk about they might have found some colours. Um, so I kind of went for like this like pinkish, pinkish shirt. Um, but it's quite a rough material so it's still coloured but it's not like the green just with that material. Mm. So they would have their churches, they would still meet, even if sometimes in secret, and still meet and go to churches. So she's put her cape on mm. over her day <laughs> It was interesting to see the different threads of thoughts mm. from each person who sewed it. Because when I saw the one with the cape on, the first thing that went into my head is, where's she going with that cape in the sun it's picking, <laughs> picking the cotton? But then when I listened to what you'd said, mm -hmm. It put it, into it put it into perspective. From a woman's perspective, I guess, 
you know, we do just make the best of things. We are creative. We do get on with it. We do take pride in ourselves, no matter what situations you face. They're both, yeah, they're both mm -hmm. women, aren't they? And they've got to go to work and they've got their hardships. Yes, yeah, she's in the feet. She's a milk, a cotton worker, but are we representing her just only in the cotton worker or all the other elements of her as that That's cotton worker? Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, if, if you can say that, if we do know that they did go to church on a Sunday, Which she could, yeah, she's got a um, work clothes on, but her headscarf yes, could be Sunday it's different. Yeah. Just plaited up different, just to add that nod of, there was a little happiness in there. They did, have yeah. fun days or yeah. nice days. Yes, she knew with the Do you know what I mean? So it's yeah. just, yes, the whole sculpture will be showing the differences, but there's little elements of happiness, sadness, like you did funniness. It was important that it wasn't just me selecting the final design, that it was, again, a, a collective response. And it was important that we tried to have a real amalgamation of all of these different designs. And so we asked Lachey if she'd be the lead designer on taking it from small figure to human size. And she was just absolutely fantastic. She rallied around everybody, gave them all of their different tasks, and they all took a different part of that, that costume and created it in full size. So I made notes. We used bits of lots of minifigures, but just so my writing makes sense i'm sketching it out as well so i can make sure that everyone's got the right idea of, of what the costume's going to look like so today i'm going to create a block for making their shirt to wear under their costumes they're both going to say wear the same design shirts because what we found in the research is that there wasn't much difference between a mill workers um, shirt and an uh, enslaved lady's shirt so we're going to make them quite similar. We're going to have like a rounded neck, no collar, and long sleeves that can roll up. Not too tight but not too baggy either because they didn't have much fabric. So at the minute I'm just taking, tracing off the basic back bodice and then after this I will check with the measurements of each lady and adjust accordingly. So I'm going to start with Louise's back. I also have extended the neckline. It needs button plackets and space for the buttonholes to go to. So we're wanting to make the sleeve of the shirt have an extra centimetre of height on the sleeve head so that then at the end we can gather that in. So this is the shirt front that I'm tracing off and then we're going to cut it out, pin it to some fabric, cut out the fabric, sew it up, see how it looks together, hopefully it's correct. And then if that's right, we'll have a shirt for one of our ladies. No, it's not a style of shirt I've made before because it's going to be a collarless shirt. Um, it's not something that I've done. And it's not going to be interface or anything like that. So it is definitely much a different type of shirt because normally shirts have a lot of structure. Um, so yeah, it will be different. And the kind of fabric that I'm using is different to what I would normally use for sh a shirt. You normally use shirt in, which would be just a little bit more sturdier. So yeah, it's different. I'm excited to see what the outcome's going to be like. Front and backs have been attached at the shoulder seam and then I am going to fit the sleeves in whilst it's still open. So this is the shirt. I'm happy with it. I'm going to have a look in the mirror, see how it looks and put the buttons on and then we'll see where it goes. If I just put the buttons on the placket, 
it will be fine. The next step in our journey was a dress rehearsal. We gathered together the stitching group and the dance group. So they worked together on those nuances that we wanted to highlight within the sculpture. It's that feeling of being enormous. And if you think that, this bizarre thing happens, you become it. We could then just look at the, the clothes, how they should be moved or tweaked or altered. Or cost card games, because they didn't have work in a cotton mill. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. But that is very representative of yeah. the cotton mill worker, right. minus the shawl. Yeah. You yeah. know, because they were working, getting, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. But, it looks right. You just reverted into the times. It's weird how costume can really do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're yeah. trying to carry, you know, the heavy and what dark the legacy yeah. story yeah. Yeah. with, you know, what we want Nottingham to recognise in mm -hmm. women's history. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. It is. And it's so poignant because we've got a lot of things happening with women's rights right yeah, about exactly. now. Yeah. So, you know, it is very, it's very significant. Well, to me, um, I think the journey's been a really good one because of all these sort of elements <clears throat> that has been in it to come here. You know, um, the friendship that's been sort of built and all the discussions and everything that had to go on to, about design, you know. And also we did the first fitting just to see how things look. So to arrive here now with them on, I think they're just lovely and it's representing what um, the project wanted. That's the way I feel anyway. Can I present Louise and Judy, our models? So yeah, to see the two women in the costumes was just, it's just mind blowing really. The amount of work that has gone into those costumes and they just look so comfortable in them. And, you know, my immediate thought was that the ancestors are just shining. The ancestors are just smiling down on, on this whole thing. Beautiful. One of the things I think that just gave such power to that room is that we created a human photogrammetry rig. So all the women surrounded Louise and Judy with their arms outstretched, uh, looking at them, creating this circle, this strong circle, to not only give Louise and Judy the sense of what it might be like going from dress rehearsal into a photogrammetry rig, but to have all of those lenses looking at them. And it was just a, such a wonderful moment of everybody coming together to represent these thousands of women and giving them voice. It was just incredibly moving. I, I literally moved me to tears. Photogrammetry is a fantastic tool for any artist to use because it does capture that instantly that moment in time. I think it'll be amazing, don't Agreed. you? Agreed. Yeah, I am looking forward to it. I always forget the number. Is it really 160 cameras working to bring a picture together? It's an extraordinary process. How's it going? Nice to see you. How are you? There's a couple of poses that we need to get. So the first one is the main pose, the two of them coming together. And then we'll do some more takes with hands and faces just to get some real good, crisp, uh, clean images. It's been really lovely actually bringing a big group to the studio for them to be part of this experience, you know, and it's amazing that Steve's been able to accommodate so many of us and they just cannot believe what's, what's going to be happening. So they're very excited. I think uh, more excited than I am. <laughs> so I'm feeling the nerves. <laughs> Yeah, that looks yeah, really yeah, no, it looks fantastic. It took a lot better than I thought it would. 101 uses for a bodkin. <laughs> I was going to say. I'll tell you when it's in the middle. Right. OK. And you do your thing now. Oh, you want that underneath? Yeah, it goes under the hair. You see, this is a better fit now, isn't it, when you look at the original? Yes, I did I think when wide. I saw you the other day, it was yeah. kind of coming off the shoulders yeah. quite a bit, wasn't it? For sure. So, yeah, this is a much better fit. It's all coming together. Um, let's have a quick look and we'll show you what we've been working on for the last three days. We're looking at a uh, mesh model preview here. And so when we're setting up the rig, we're thinking about this output here of like what we want to get detail wise. So with photogrammetry, it's all about the volume and making sure that the volume is all in this sphere of focus. So what we do to begin with is measure out that sphere um, and make sure that each capture can capture the subject from front to back. It brings in 160 
different shots and works out how to align them. So behind the scenes, the software is looking for similar pixel patterns in each still image and then bringing them all together to create this sort of wire mesh. Have, have you got a bit of um, a pen that you can mark that tape out a bit more? We've had some trial runs with the uh, standing models. So they've been uh, working in the rig. We've been marking out where their feet are so that they can help to guide the models once they're all dressed and ready. We Lean want well. to dress up as well. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can kick them out of their costumes. Sit out. Yeah. I'm going have a go. Yeah. They're absolutely fantastic, the costumes. Yeah. You feel comfortable? Mm -hmm. Sure. Interesting that we've now got more blue because the white had to become blue for the cameras, I understand. And a few things don't quite hang the way we want them to, so there's more work for the stitches. But it's wonderful having people trim your loose ends. The historic data was showing us that enslaved men's trousers were given to the women yeah. and they wore them as undergarments with the tie around the knee to stop insects coming up. So we felt that maybe they wouldn't be spending the time folding them over and hemming them neatly. Yeah. So we've yeah. gone for a fray. Okay. However, if that's bronze, that's going to be quite sharp. Yeah, definitely. And we want to sort of so it's finding that yeah, middle ground, so that's why we've left it, to see if we can get some advice on what to do. Yeah. The thing is, once you fold it, you've not got anything to work with, because yeah. you've got to remember, you can sort of uh, 3D model all of that in or out. Right. So I think if it's how you want it, visually how you want it... We can digitally edit yeah. as we need to make it better. A lot of this is in the preparation, so we spend hours, days setting up each shot so that when the client arrives we've already had all that communication and got everything in the right place so that we can work effectively with them to focus on like the pose, the weight, the eye contact and all those sort of traditional things that is what's going to make the best sort of sculpture possible. So here's the test shot from yesterday with Tom, with Tom and uh, and Damien in and what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to take a shot and within 10, well, five minutes or so we can have a low res preview it's the magic button oh, I see. so we'll yeah. be able to take a shot look across yeah. see the image on the screen there and yeah. there's your original and honestly if you get in there and it's not right then let's just take it back out yeah. and to it you know it's like we you know it's going to be that one moment yeah so let's make sure it's perfect yeah. So we've been at the studio now for over an hour. There's lots of activity happening. Uh, we've got our two models being dressed in their costume. Uh, we're going through everything with fine detail. There's a few things on the back of the mill workers' um, apron that's just not right. So I think if anything's not right, we stop and we address. So we're unstitching and restitching just so we get it absolutely spot on. Right, so can you pinch here yeah. and here? Yes. Okay, mm. this is manageable. Let's have the bodkin and then. Cut. Can anybody see um, the bodkin? Uh, bodkin. I think, I think um, Marcia has the bodkin. Yeah. Oh no, that's good. That works. This that's is right. better. fitting better on the body. Just keep it still while I just salt this. I want to show these simple features like the knot and how it hangs on the body. If we pin this one here, is this, is this is this feeling all right? Oh, yes, fine. People's <laughs> there. That's it in there. That's nice there. I think I'm ready to give it a go. The 60s, the one side gone. I'll, um, I'll go and um, let them know we're going to try the first, first pose. Here we go. <laughs> Steve, I think we're ready to have a first go. Excellent, brilliant. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah. To position. The whole team has just been absolutely fabulous. Uh, everybody's been rallying around, uh, making sure that everything is just right. The feet are looking great. The way that the fabrics are moving is looking good. Yeah, that works fine. There. Fine. Yeah. Here we go. I think we're going to go for one. Okay. Okay, eye contact with each other. Nice and relaxed. Move your hands up and rock together. Hold. And relax. I can't quite see um, the faces too well. Maybe I'll go get my glasses. Yeah. Oh, much better. I can see it now. <laughs> <laughs> 
So unlike my first experience of photogrammetry, where I was actually dressed as the model and in the rig, this time I get to operate the button. So whatever I click and I see, that's going to be what the world's going to see in the sculpture. Um, lift the back seat. Nice. Okay, let's hold it there. All right, we're going to flash in three, two, one. Well, it's a new experience, it's a different experience. It is, we don't do this every day. <laughs> so what's it doing, Pam? So now it's gonna make a preview, which will give us more of like a solid sort of oh, shape to it. Right, okay. So it's very quick, <laughs> so we don't get all the texture appearing yet. That yeah. takes a couple of hours, but it should be enough for us to... Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> Go share that. Um, see what they think. And that's low red. I know, and it looks amazing already. Yeah. Well, they're, they're gonna. You'll hear the screams from here. <gasps> you, oh to do my days! Judy, Judy, that here. is amazing. Oh Louise, I can see you. And this is low oh, red. Lovely. This is that's low amazing. red. Judy, come in and have a look. Oh, oh, I, know, I can see amazing. you as well. Oh. Beautiful. Louise, come oh, to in front and have a look. <laughs> Oh, can Just you see? They're lovely. Wow. Oh, can't wait. That's not us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> can't it's wait till he goes on that penny. <laughs> Isn't oh, that absolutely word. gorgeous? Yeah. That last thought? pose was mm. just it, so it, 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 lovely. Yeah. You relaxed, you were really enjoying it. Something so simple could mm. be so beautiful. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not a bit shaky, but we're pleased that we're doing it, you know. Mm. What's come much more easily at last has been the hands. That's right. Because we've had them up, Before, down, yeah. and that's... Quite no a few changes, yeah. yeah. And it just feels as though we're holding on to each other. Because we're showing such a lot of the underneath and the cameras can't see both her legs, uh -huh. they need to get uh, that data yeah. to put it inside the skirt. Yeah, I think so if you we'll lift that up... Once she's in position then, We'll do one without up. and... Well, get skirts her in position, down. skirts down, and then skirts up, I yeah. think. Do you want to come a little yeah. bit further forward? That's it. Just yeah, come a little so. fraction towards me. That's it. So, Louise, you let us know when you feel comfortable, and then when you're ready for, for Marcia to go, and then we'll do the picture. OK, whenever you're ready. Three, two, one. Beautiful. And relax. <laughs> if you let, your, if you let your skirt go. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I can get Judy. Yeah, that's Okay, Judy, nice and relaxed. Three, two, one. Beautiful. Okay. Yep, yeah, that's all good. Yeah. We've uh, had both models together in their initial pose, and then we've been working on them individually. So just in case there's any areas where when the two ladies come together and you can't quite see those bits of the skirt or the fabric, we've done individual poses as well. The way we see it is it's like one big camera. So if you're going to get people in there, you've really got to concentrate on just capturing that moment. So as well as it being high tech, it's like going back to the essence of photography about really thinking through each shot and just pressing that button when everything lights up and pops and comes together. We're just going to focus on your face, right. but what I'd like you to do is just you and Louise focus on each other and imagine that you're touching and imagine that you're doing that same pose as you did before. Okay, take a nice deep breath, relax. Okay. Excellent. Yes. Whenever you're feeling ready, Louise. Uh, imagine Judy said something really funny to me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Does that come through all right? Yeah, all right. Wonderful. 
Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah, exactly. That's so maybe it's just to try and get both of you in together. All right. Okay, ladies, so if you can put your hands together, like we were doing that before, that's it. Three, two, one. Okay. That's it. Wait, do any more? I think, no, I think I'm, I'm happy. You're all happy? Yeah, I'm good. We're all happy. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to find something else we need. <laughs> well done, feet! Look, we've got these most beautiful feet. <laughs> I don't know. Louise and Judy have been absolutely fantastic. You know, they've had such a long day and they've been pulled and pushed around and sculpted in so many different directions, but they've just been absolutely amazing. And thanks to Steve and all his fantastic team um, for supporting us today. It's just been a truly magical day that I think these ladies are never going to forget. I just feel you're someone I have known for a long, long time in some distant past. And it's wonderful. One just never know. When you peel back <laughs> the layers, we are all connected in some way. The connections are there, you just need to look for it. Co-creation is, you know, it's, it's a longer process but I think when you're creating a piece of sculpture that's going to go out in the public realm, it needs to be rooted to that place. And if I just created a piece and placed it there, then that meaning, that connection, that the, the work of many is lost. But I think what you get with the co-creation of a piece is that it's not just my work, it's the work of hundreds of women that have got involved in this project that then they take ownership of that piece. It's their, their work and it's their sculpture and it's their legacy that they can go along to see the sculpture when it's installed, point to the bit and say, I made that and share that with their family. And for me as a sculptor, if I can leave that legacy, but help others to leave that legacy on our city, then I know I've done my job well.